need to change my uh, the taste in my mouth from all this yummy food. I'm just going to keep it real. So. <laughs> it's a blessing to be here in the presence of my fathers, in the presence of all of you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here in your beautiful church. And uh, may the blessings of our Lord's Transfiguration be with, be with us and, uh, of course, of Holy Week. Um, in light of what I just shared, uh, my open confession, <laughs> I wanted to ask if uh, you give us permission to wanted to have just a few minutes, uh, maybe to do a quiet meditation. That's okay, just to kind of sink in, sink in, uh, allow everything to sink in from today. And if I can trouble, it's up to if you can just that. Uh, so let me just explain. So <laughs> I wanted to just take a moment to do a quick uh, meditation exercise. Just allow us all just to sit quietly for a little bit, to take in the events of uh, today particularly. Um, so we can do that um, by um, closing our eyes. You know, just close our eyes. Just take a moment. Just allow the events to uh, kind of sink in, the events of today. And we can uh, listen to Abuna. We will kindly please just if you would just be O you who for the love of mankind became man, you girded yourself with a towel to cleanse us from the stains of our sins. We ask you, O Christ our God, to hear us and have mercy. O you who prepared for us the way of life through the washing of the holy chosen disciples' feet, we ask you, O Christ our God, hear us and have mercy. O Christ our God, who walked above the waters and through your love for mankind washed the disciples' feet, we ask you, O Christ our God, to hear us and have mercy. O you who clothed himself in light, like a garment, girded himself, and washed the disciples' feet and wiped them, we ask you to hear us and have mercy. Thank you so much. Um, as this uh, very exciting and blessed day began this morning, uh, many of you may remember um, that as the day progressed and unfolded, um, it's probably one of the most action-packed, I think, eventful days of this week, um, if, if you're measuring in terms of um, things that happen, you know, uh, different events that happen in the Lord's <clears throat> in the Lord's life throughout this day. And I wanted to take a moment with you to meditate on some of those events, um, beginning first with the blessing of the water, but particularly with Christ washing the feet of the disciples. Um, you know, as Abuna had just uh, prayed the litanies for us, I think that it's um, it's remarkable that we get the blessing during this week to pause and to reflect and to relive the experience that our Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples. And I think that it's um, for our benefit, and I want to take a moment to meditate on that first. So let me just first share the sequence of events. So first we have the washing of our Lord's or the washing of our, the beloved disciples' uh, feet by our Lord. And then uh, we also have from there the um, Eucharist, the Eucharistic institution, right? When when our Lord first gave uh, the, uh, the Eucharist, uh, started the, uh, the Last Supper, or the uh, mystical supper as we know it. And then from there we also have See, our Lord journeys into Gethsemane and begins to pray on our behalf in John 17. Um, and it's just an immense, huge prayer. Um, and what a, what a beautiful example. Our son will get into that a little bit. Um, and we see the, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. And our Lord um, exhorts us to, to, um, to walk in the spirit and, and not to allow the, the weakness of the flesh to, to take precedence. Um, soon thereafter, we see the betrayal, the fulfillment of the betrayal. Um, unfolding um, that um, occurred to our Lord Jesus Christ by the hands of Judas Iscariot. And then we see the trial, um, the trial, the unjust, the unfair trial. Even for the Jews, it was a trial that wasn't uh, lawful. And some of those who were there spoke up about that. And from there, of course, we see our Lord taken into custody, right? And the rest of the journey to the cross begins. Um, we rewind for a second again to the washing of the disciples' feet. And I wanted to open up and ask, what's the significance of this? What's the significance of our Lord Jesus Christ 
washing the feet of his disciples then and now for us. And that's the reflection for, for this part first. For them, for his beloved disciples, who are the pioneers and the foreigners of our church, what was the significance for them to have our Lord wash his feet, wash their feet? Allow me to read a portion from the gospel, which answers this. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. Just wanted to pause for a second on that first part right there. It says, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands. It's a proclamation for everyone that God, that Jesus Christ is God and that he has given the power from the Father. He has that power. But yet then the very next action that occurs is the washing. I just wanted to emphasize that for a moment. Why? What's the significance of that being read on us or said? And he had come from God and was going to God. He rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now. But you will know after this, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. He's speaking of Judas Iscariot. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? It's the second time, right? Did you guys catch that? The second time that Jesus is asking a question. Do you know why I'm doing this? There's deep significance and our Lord wants us all to know what is the reason for this action. He says, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, here it comes you also ought to wash one another's feet. And I apologize if it's, uh, you know, preaching to the choir here, right? It sounds cliche, but I think it's significant for me, first and foremost, to, to meditate on what happened. And again, remember and consider why it was done and why does it have significance in our lives today? Because I don't know about you, but um, there's so much going on this week, and especially today, that it's very easy for someone like me to just overlook um, to just not even realize, you know, even in within the church, there's so much going on, right? And we can fail to realize or to grasp in the moment what's happening and what our Lord is teaching us because our God's teachings transcend time, right? And we know the, the mystery of the liturgy that it transcends time and, and everything is suspended and we're here in the moment with him. The same with this great mystery that God had instituted, our Lord. He said, I say to you a servant, I'm sorry, If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So the the first point, if I may, is to set the example, right? Obviously, to set the example for me and for you. You set the example for them. And we who are trying our best every day, faithfully, to the best of our ability to follow our Lord Jesus Christ, humbly are his disciples today. We are his disciples. Jesus said in the gospel, you are my disciples 
if you do my words. I think all of us are trying our best. We hear his words, we hear the sermons, and we're trying to live them. Therefore, we are his disciples. And the same message that he gave them is for us. He has set an example that he didn't need to. He didn't have to do it that way. He didn't have to do it at all. But here's the next thing. If you know... So I stop and I think, how can I do that? Our blessed fathers, they do it literally. They anoint our feet, they bless us, and they follow in the footsteps of the Lord. But what about you and I? How can we wash each other's feet every day or whenever we find an opportunity? I don't have the exact answers, but I want my mind to begin thinking that way. I want to be affected eternally today and going into tomorrow and the rest of the days. What he has done, he said, I have done it to set an example. And he said, there is Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant, we're all servants, is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. God is calling all of us. We're all sent. Remember the man who was born blind? He was sent to the pool, right? Slow, it means sent. We are all sent. God has opened all of our eyes. We haven't finished the journey of Holy Week, but we had 55 days before Holy Week to begin. God was priming us. He was preparing our minds for everything that he wants to accomplish in our lives today during Holy Week. This is my favorite day, and I want to give you the blessing of coming today to talk. And... Um, I know it was so that I can learn something. and I just want to impart little bits of things that I've been thinking about with you. That was the first thing is that that message was not exclusive to a certain group of people. It's to all of mankind, anyone who's willing to hear, anyone who wants to follow in Jesus' footsteps. How? Ask. I can't tell you how to wash someone's feet. We're very creative. It can be something as simple as a smile on someone's face, right? It can change the course of someone's actions. Opening a door, helping someone if you're younger, helping someone with homework, whatever it may be. Calling and asking about someone you haven't seen for a while, whatever it may be. But let us together take some time to think about how can I wash someone's feet? How can I put aside my, myself and put someone before me? So this was the first um, reflection, if you would allow me, I wanted to share. The second thing is the institution of the Divine Liturgy, this um, Eucharistic sacrifice, which I've learned that uh, the word Eucharist itself means offering, right? The liturgy itself is the work of the people. I think it's so interesting that God, our Lord Jesus Christ, established this sacrament on the same day, right after he first teaches us how to serve. It's all intertwined. It's all connected. He's saying the way to service is to empty yourself, to put others before you, to serve the least of these humbly, and then continue in the work of the people in doing what? Remembering what he did. That makes sense. Remembering his sacrifice. As our fathers say in the liturgy, as our Lord said, take, eat, right? This is my body. Talks about his body being broken for me and for you, right? His blood being shed for the remission of our sins. It's all about service. And that's why our Lord proclaimed, I did not come to be served, but to, and to give my life as a ransom. And it just blows my mind away when I think about how many times in one day, our Lord Jesus Christ wanted to show and emphasize this point. Even when he was agonizing, when he was in immense internal, emotional, spiritual, you can name it, to the point of physical blood was coming out. Even when that was his moment, right? 
And, and as a human, the Son of Man, he needed consolation. He needed some comfort. But we, I wasn't there for him, if you would, right? They were sleeping. We're humans. And he even gave them excuse. He said, the flesh is weak, but the spirit. What I'm trying to get to is this. Even in that moment where it would have been justifiable if it was all about him, what did he say? Not my will, but yours. It's a perfect model. He's our perfect model for service. And I'm not talking about a formal, consecrated type of service. It's a living service every single day in our jobs, our workplaces, in our schools, in our relationships with one another, at home, our husbands, our wives, with our children. I'm in desperate need of pointers and, and, and tips on how to be a better dad and husband. But what I'm trying to say is, let's begin today. Let's say this is the day the Lord has made. Help me, Lord, to follow in your example. Help me, O oh Lord, not just to be a spectator in this amazing event, but a partaker, a partaker in this divine mystery. And that's what he longs for. And that's why in John chapter 17, if you read it and you, and you pray it, you can literally pray the same words that our Lord prayed. He prays for us. Not only for, he says, those who are with him, but for those who would believe by their word. He's praying for us. His prayer is transcending decades and centuries and years. He is praying for me and for you that what I have done would affect you so powerfully that you would take it and give it to others. This is, this is I, I believe, I believe that this is truly the essence of what Christ is telling us in his Passion Week. It's his passion for us. There was a verse that stood out this year to me. Um, just was just pressing on my heart to eat in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2. And it hit me this year as to speak about what motivated our Lord. He was fully human as much as he was fully God. We all believe this with everything that we are. Everything that he experienced was authentic, real, everything. So Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus again. And look at our, our mother always puts the icon before us. The church always puts him always before our eyes. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the one who started the story of our lives and the finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And someone asks you, why would anyone do what he did? It was his pleasure. It was a joy. You know, in Arabic, there's this simple saying, uh, and he tells you the response usually in our culture is, Right? Or in English, you say, why would you do, why do you did so much for us? It's my pleasure. And we pray it's sincere when we say that to one another, but Jesus was definitely sincere. For the joy, when he kept falling with the cross, he would get up and say, it's my joy. You are my joy. You, I love. For you, I died. For you, I would die again. Right? Every tear he shed, Every drop of blood was for me and you to enjoy what he has done forever. It's, I'm sorry, I get emotional. I don't mean to because it's really, it's, it's moving when you think about what he has done for us and that it wasn't even a burden, but it was a joy. I mean, what, 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 what great love is this? As St. John says, behold, what manner of love God has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. And our fathers in the liturgy, they pray, as a good father, you have travailed, you have labored for me, right? It was a joy. Everything was a joy. It's not to exclude the pain or disregard the pain and the suffering, but he did it with joy. We were before his eyes it's as if he had our picture and he kept reminding himself for you, for you, for you, for me. That's what it was. Then we see the betrayal. Um, you know, I, I still, until today, I marvel at 
just the whole scenario of the betrayal and and even scripture that talks about Judas and the son of perdition and you know and I've asked fathers before what if what if it wasn't Judas would it have been some I betray him and I'm not trying to sound cliche or I'm I'm serious what when will I realize that the act of Judas per se is my act it's what I have done in small scales and I, I, I'm no one, and I'm not. I hope I'm not making anyone feel bad. But I'm trying to remind myself of just this awareness that what what happened to Christ, it had to be done. God knew it, it, it had to be done, and the way it was done, it's above me. But what I'm trying to say is, we can learn from the lesson. We can say what? How many years have I been a part of this church? The Coptic Orthodox faith. Since I was born for some of you, for others, like myself, I was actually baptized at an older age, around 12 years old. I didn't come to know the richness of the Coptic church until later. What I'm trying to get to is there's others even who have been from other religious backgrounds who have been immersed into our church and embrace it wholeheartedly, right? But the point to be made is this. Although we live with Christ every day, we sleep next to him. I mean, we believe that, right? We say our nightly prayers. We ask for his accompaniment, accompanying for the, for the whole night. We, we wake up and we ask for him to be with us as we go through the day. We read the Holy Scripture. We pray. We, we continuously are walking with him. We, we believe that, right? Yet, as a human, I betray him at times. I betray him maybe not vocally. But I betray him with my thoughts. I betray him with my actions. I betray him in subtle ways. But what was unique about Judas's betrayal was it was with a deep sign of love. It was a kiss. It was a kiss. I need to ask myself, do I betray the Lord openly? Or subtly? Am I betraying him in a way that is even more devious, per se, than Judas? I'm thinking about this for myself because I don't want to be a Judas. I want to be someone who, like St. Peter, realizes that even though I've betrayed Christ or I've denied him, there is hope. That's the difference. His Eminence Ambassador Robin once gave a compare and contrast sermon or a talk about the difference between the betrayal or the denial of both individuals. And as I just casually mentioned, it was hope. One had a relationship that was deeply rooted in hope and understanding of God's infinite mercy versus another who didn't realize that if I could simply not just repent in action, because he did that, right? repented but if I can come back and change my behavior if I can know the mercy of God that compels me to change that will be the defining factor I pray that um, I'm not Judas in my thoughts and my actions and we can we can Remember, in today's procession for Judas, it was, I don't know if, if anyone caught it, but um, allow me please to just bring to light something that's very unique about it. We did the procession in the opposite direction, correct? We do it clockwise. We actually are going clockwise. So you would think that it's the right direction, right? Is that correct? But it's the opposite. Judas went the way of the world which is the way that I go every day at times. It's very easy. He was betrayed. Judas was a victim. He was a victim as we all are at times. I'm not talking about the ending, what happened. He was a victim in the sense, sounds like I'm defending Judas here. I don't mean to do that. But <laughs> what I'm trying to simply say is we all go in the way of the world. But our church teaches us in our normal processions to go counterclockwise. 
the opposite, right? Against the grain, right? I say Nathanesu said the world, I, they told him the world is against you, right? But I am against the world. This, this is, is cried out throughout the centuries. And we say it every time we say the creed, we believe this by our faith, by what we believe Christ has done for us. This is how we can counteract the behavior and the ending of Judas in our own lives is by not following the way of the world. Because Jesus, in today's one of today's readings, he actually said, I am not of this world. I am not of this world. And everything that he did as an example was to teach us to follow his steps, not as the world does, do I do. Even in our anguish, even, even he showed us, right? When he was praying, when he was overwhelmed, he showed us. Turn our anguish, turn our sorrow, our struggles and tribulation into prayer. The last point on this, and I'll, I'll be done. I don't want to take too much time. Is um, If you remember not too long ago, when we read the book of is it Tobit? Tobit, everyone all right? Tobit, yeah. You remember Sarah? Sarah, the, the woman who was, she was tormented, right? She was tormented by the evil spirits that would kill her husbands every time she got married. Seven times, right? Sounds pretty morbid, right? But it's a true story. But what, what was amazing from the story this year that I noticed was in the very beginning, it says after she was ridiculed, right? She was ridiculed. She was made fun of by the people in the village. What did she do? She intended to go to the upper room and to kill herself. Her plan was to take her life. If you remember this part. But she came to her senses in that moment. She said, instead of shaming my father, I will lift it up in prayer. And in that very moment, she prayed while someone else prayed and God received their prayers and planned out their salvation together. And I thought it was remarkable because all of these characters leading up to the fulfillment of what God is telling us through these people in his prayer was that when we're saying, Thok teti gom nimpi, oh, thine is the power, the glory, it is that in his anguish, there is power. In his pain and suffering, there is glory. As it was said in a sermon one time on the cross, and I'm, I'm actually happy that the resurrection, the resurrected side is on there right now, correct? But there's two sides to it, right? <laughs> there's two sides to it. But sometimes we get stuck in the crucifixion side. It's not to say that, that we shouldn't always have the crucifixion before our eyes, but there is a time in our anguish, in our suffering, to turn it, turn it into prayer, turn it into glory to God. Tell Him, Lord, I will glory in my sufferings, as you did. When, when the women wept for Him, He said, women of Jerusalem, don't weep over me. Weep over your sins, right? As we're chanting this festal, chant for the rest of the days for the rest of the day here and um, I, I pray that as we chant it we embrace the power of his resurrection and the power that he gave us through his suffering as saint paul says that if we suffer with christ we will we will uh, we will partake of his glory in his resurrection Glory be to God forever. And thank you guys for your time. And I want to thank you for the blessing. Thank you.